Imagine a creature with the jaws of a gorilla and the teeth of a hippopotamus roaming the earth millions of years ago. They were tough, resilient, and perfectly adapted to their harsh environment. But what if I told you that they also carried a hidden secret that connects us all, even today? Meet Paranthropus, an ancient hominin whose remains tell a surprising tale, and discover the shocking truth about the origin of a virus that has plagued humanity for millennia. The discovery of Paranthropus began quite unexpectedly in 1938, when a schoolboy stumbled upon fossil fragments on a hillside at Kromdrai in South Africa. These seemingly insignificant fragments, at first, were brought to the attention of Robert Broom, a paleontologist from the Transvaal Museum. Intrigued, Broom decided to investigate further and soon found additional pieces that fit together like a complex puzzle, all coming from what he would discover to be the same skull. Upon examining the skull's unique features, which consisted of remarkably large premolar and molar teeth, and a robust, strongly built lower jaw, Broom realized something revolutionary, as he was looking at something entirely new. With excitement, he would later announce the find as a new species, Paranthropus robustus. However, this wasn't just your ordinary species, but actually the first official recognition of an unusual branch of our evolutionary tree. Adding to the bizarreness of the story, the Paranthropus didn't stop in South Africa, in fact, 23 years later, in 1959, another significant discovery was made, but this time in East Africa by Mary Leakey. Famous for discovering earth-shattering finds like the Australopithecus boise, Homo habilis, and Laetoli footprints, Mary unearthed more fossils that would be attributed to the Paranthropus genus. As with many of her discoveries, this find opened the floodgates, leading to the discovery of over 300 Paranthropus fossils over the years, spread across various locations. These fossils today have expanded our understanding, revealing three distinct species within the Paranthropus group, each with unique adaptations and characteristics. This extensive fossil record has even gone further to paint a clearer picture of a lineage that once thrived across the African landscape, providing vital clues about their lifestyle, diet, and role in our evolutionary history, with its name based on the Greek words para, meaning beside or near, and anthropos, meaning man. Three different species of Paranthropus existed, the Paranthropus boise, named for Charles Boise, who contributed to funding Louise Leakey's fossil hunting expeditions. The Paranthropus ethiopicus, named for Ethiopia, the location of the type specimen Homo 18. And the Paranthropus robustus, named for the robust skull and jaws of the species. Interestingly, the Paranthropus were not all found in the same place, but rather scattered across vast distances. For example, Fossils of Paranthropus ethiopicus and the more modern species Paranthropus boise were discovered in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, all in East Africa, while fossils of Paranthropus robustus were discovered all the way in South Africa, with over a hundred specimens coming from the Swartkrantz limestone cave. What did these ancient creatures look like? Tempting as it might be to think of Paranthropus as a direct ancestor to humans, this weird species actually represents a side branch of our evolutionary tree. See, while they lived around the same time as some of our early ancestors, such as Homo habilis, Paranthropus actually had distinct adaptations that set them apart. For one, the three species within this genus all displayed a range of physical traits that reflect unique evolutionary paths. What do we mean? Well, the Paranthropus ethiopicus appears to have been much larger than the other two species. However, we can't be sure of their exact size, because due to limited skeletal evidence, reconstructing their exact sizes is challenging. In contrast, however, Paranthropus robustus and Boise were likely only slightly larger than Australopithecus africanus. One thing all three species had in common, though, was that the males were significantly larger than females a feature we call sexual dimorphism. Another weird fact about the Paranthropus was their unique resemblance to modern-day apes. Another good example was how their rib cages were cone-shaped like those of apes, rather than the barrel shape seen in humans. Cognitively, they also shared a resemblance to apes, as their brains were relatively small. 
Like chimps of today, their brains ranged between 420 cubic centimeters in Paranthropus ethiopicus to about 520 cubic centimeters in Paranthropus boise and robustus. It seemed everything about this species was unexpected, as even the skull structure of Paranthropus was also quite unexpected. I mean, it had ape-like cranial features with a flat forehead and a prominent brow ridge above the eyes. The face was no less intriguing, as they were relatively broad with flaring cheekbones. Paranthropus ethiopicus even had a more projecting face than the other species in this genus, which had shorter, flatter faces. Coming together, all Paranthropus species had a spinal cord that passed through the center of the skull base, indicating they walked upright. On the part of sexual dimorphism, the males had a distinctive bony ridge running along the top of their skull, known as the sagittal crest, which served as an anchor for their powerful jaw muscles. Speaking of their jaws and teeth, the Paranthropus had large gorilla-like jaws, specifically adapted to a diet of tough plant foods. Because of this, the front teeth, mainly incisors and canines, were very small compared to their extremely large molars, which were effective for crushing and grinding. We'll dive more into them in a bit. The jaws themselves were large and robust, and were built to support strong chewing muscles. In terms of their limbs and pelvis, the Paranthropus had legs with human-like features, which further suggested that they had the ability to walk upright. However, their arms were relatively long compared to their legs, a trait that is more common in apes. Their pelvis just threw the whole species into the uncanny valley, as it was very similar to that of Australopithecus and designed for walking on two legs. It's important to note that it lacked the refinements needed for the more efficient, striding walking step of modern humans. With all this, you would think the Paranthropus led directly to humans, or at least great apes. Well, you would be wrong, because instead of being our direct ancestors, the Paranthropus were more like an evolutionary experiment. They were basically a group that adapted to specific ecological niches, but somehow did not survive to the present day. Standing at an average height of 156 centimeters or 5 feet 11 inches and weighing 40 to 50 kilograms or 88 to 110 pounds, the Paranthropus has no living descendants today. But that doesn't mean they didn't leave something for modern humans. But before we look at the unexpected gift they left for us, let's look at another confusing part of the species, their diet. Quick pause. If you're enjoying this journey through the prehistoric world, don't forget to like and subscribe. More than 97% of our viewers watch without subscribing, and we'd love to have you join our tribe. It would make all the difference. So, is it done? Great, thanks a ton. The diet of Paranthropus is one of the most intriguing aspects of its evolutionary story. For a long time, scientists believed that the genus's large teeth, robust jaws, and powerful chewing muscles which were traits prominently displayed in Paranthropus boise, were adaptations for consuming hard foods like nuts, seeds, and hard fruits. Nicknamed Nutcracker Man, these conclusions were largely drawn from the shape and wear patterns of their teeth. The large, flat molars and the massive sagittal crest seemed perfect for cracking open tough, fibrous plant material. However, this thought process wouldn't last, as recent studies have challenged this traditional view. Starting off with a plot twist, the Paranthropus boise had particularly large and low-cusped post-canine teeth and a very robust jaw, which initially led scientists to believe this species was built to chew hard objects like nuts. This notion was championed by dental microwear studies on Paranthropus robustus, which showed molar wear patterns consistent with the ingestion of small, hard food items. These microwear patterns also suggested that, even if nuts and seeds were not their primary foods, they were fallback options when other resources were scarce. However, that was not the case, and a twist came when newer dental microwear texture analyses found no evidence that Paranthropus boise ever consumed hard foods. This surprising discovery flipped decades of understanding on its head and suggested that these hominins might have been chewing something else entirely. To get a clearer picture, scientists turned to stable carbon isotope analysis, a method that examines the chemical signatures locked in tooth enamel, revealing the types of plants an animal ate millions of years ago. Here's where it gets really interesting. 
because the analysis showed that Paranthropus robustus consumed a mixed diet of both C3 plants, such as trees and shrubs, which include fruits and leaves similar to what chimpanzees eat, and some C4 plants, like tropical grasses and sedges. In stable isotope analysis, C3 and C4 refer to two different types of photosynthesis plants use. Essentially, C3 plants, like wheat and rice, thrive in cooler, wetter conditions and have a distinct carbon isotope pattern, while C4 plants, such as corn and sugarcane, are adapted to hot, sunny environments and show a different carbon isotope signature. By examining these patterns, scientists can gain insights into past climates, diets, and agricultural practices of ancient people. Basically, Paranthropus robustus was a generalist, taking advantage of different foods available in its environment. In contrast, however, shockingly, the Paranthropus boise from East Africa was different and showed a strong reliance on C4 plants. In fact, stable isotopes from Paranthropus boise fossils revealed a diet predominantly composed of C4 biomass, which typically includes grasses and sedges found in savanna and wetland environments. This finding was particularly striking because it sets Paranthropus boise apart not just from its southern African cousin, but from all known hominids, modern or fossil. It essentially had more in common in diet with cows than other hominids. But why did these two Paranthropus species have such different diets? Well, one theory is that their distinct environments played a role. The habitats of Paranthropus boise in East Africa included open and well-watered areas, like deltaic environments and grasslands, where C4 plants were more prevalent. On the other hand, Paranthropus robustus lived in regions where a mixture of plant types, including C3 and C4, were available, allowing for a more varied diet. Another reason could be an adaptive divergence where Paranthropus boisei specialized in consuming grasses or sedges, while Paranthropus robustus maintained a more traditional hominoid diet and included tree fruits and other C3 resources, along with some C4 plants. This dietary specialization likely helped each species thrive in their respective environments, but also contributed to their distinct evolutionary paths. So, back to the nickname. Was Nutcracker Man really cracking nuts? Well, based on current evidence, it probably was not. In an unexpected twist, the strong jaws and large teeth of Paranthropus boise might have been adaptations not for hard nuts, but for processing large quantities of tough, fibrous grass and sedge material. In fact, Paranthropus boise, based on stable isotope results from 22 individual Sosimensa, had a diet of 77% C4 plants and was statistically indistinguishable from cows and horses. So, just think more of a cow grazing than a person cracking open a walnut. In short, while Paranthropus was once thought to be nature's nutcracker, modern science suggests a more complex story. Although there isn't direct evidence, there is compelling evidence suggesting that Paranthropus species use tools. However, Bear in mind that their tool use appears to have been less sophisticated and diverse compared to other early hominins, like Homo habilis and Homo erectus. At various archaeological sites, such as Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, where Paranthropus boise remains have been found, researchers have also discovered Olduan stone tools. These tools, which include sharp-edged flakes and choppers made from stone, are the simplest and oldest known stone tools. While these tools are more commonly associated with early Homo species, their presence at sites where Paranthropus fossils have been discovered suggests that these robust hominins may have used them as well. Not to mention there is some evidence to suggest that Paranthropus robustus in South Africa might have utilized bone tools. At sites like Swatkrans, researchers have identified bone fragments that seem to have been modified and used as digging sticks possibly for extracting tubers, roots, or termites from the ground. This theory works out because it aligns with the isotopic evidence that points to a diet that includes a variety of plant foods and possibly small animals. However, it is crucial to note that while there is evidence of Paranthropus using tools, there is no direct evidence that they manufactured these tools themselves. In fact, the association with stone tools might simply indicate that Paranthropus used tools that were already available in their environment, or perhaps made by other hominins living in the same area.
Compared to early Homo species, Paranthropus seems to have had a more limited tool repertoire, likely relying more on their robust cranial and dental adaptations to process food. These physical features, such as powerful jaws and large molars, suggest that Paranthropus was well adapted to a diet that included hard and fibrous plant material, reducing the need for sophisticated tool use. This also indicates that this group of hominids, while capable of using tools opportunistically, did not depend on them as their primary means of survival. Instead, their reliance on their unique physical adaptations points to a different evolutionary strategy, one that combined both natural abilities and basic tool use to navigate their environment. Okay, now let's talk about what they left for future hominins. And spoiler alert, we wish we could return their gift. Herpes, the unexpected gift. Although a very disgusting disease, herpes is actually a fascinating and complex virus that has a unique relationship with its hosts, even evolving alongside them across millions of years. One of the oldest viruses we know, each species tends to have its own specific herpes viruses, which have adapted to the specific biological and ecological niches of their hosts. For humans, there are two primary types of herpes simplex viruses, HSV-1, which typically causes oral herpes, and HSV-2, which is usually responsible for genital herpes. The intriguing question now is, if herpes is so specific, how did humans end up with two distinct herpes viruses? Well, to understand this, we need to go into the evolutionary history of these viruses. See, HSV-1 has been infecting the human lineage for a very long time, with some research even suggesting that HSV-1 has been present in hominins since at least the split from the common ancestors of chimpanzees approximately 6 to 7 million years ago. This estimate is based on comparing the modern human variants of HSV-1 with those found in chimpanzees. By analyzing the genetic differences and understanding that DNA mutates at a relatively constant rate, scientists can estimate when these viruses diverged showing a long-standing association with human ancestors. However, in contrast, HSV-2 has a much more recent entry into the human lineage. It is believed that HSV-2 started infecting the ancestors of modern humans between 3 million and 1.4 million years ago, much later than HSV-1. This timeline means HSV-2 somehow must have jumped from another species to early humans, since by that time, the human lineage had already diverged from that of chimpanzees. So, where did HSV-2 come from? Well, the answer seems to lie with our now extinct relatives, the Paranthropus. In fact, a recent study suggests that the ancestors of modern humans may have acquired HSV-2 from Paranthropus boisei, to be specific. Researchers theorize that the Paranthropus boisei might have been infected with HSV-2 after scavenging on the meat of ancestral chimpanzees. They suspect that they were exposed, possibly through open sores or bites. The spread of HSV-2 to the ancestors of modern humans likely didn't happen through direct sexual contact between different species, but through environmental interactions. For instance, early humans could have contracted the virus by scavenging meat or sharing water sources with an infected Paranthropus boisei. Sadly, once HSV-2 entered the human lineage, it was there to stay easily transmitted from mother to child and through various forms of contact, including sexual activity. Interestingly, the evolutionary path of HSV-2 and its eventual adaptation to humans shows the complexity and fluidity of viral evolution. Unlike many other viruses, herpes has a unique ability to remain latent in the body, periodically reactivating and spreading without causing immediate harm to the host. This is especially dangerous as it helps it persist over long evolutionary periods. In fact, this evolutionary strategy has enabled herpes viruses to adapt specifically to their hosts, making them highly specialized over time. Not everyone believes this though, but future discoveries of hominin fossils and further genetic analysis might provide even more clues. However, for now, Paranthropus boisei stands as a strong candidate for the origins of genital herpes in humans. So what caused the extinction of the Paranthropus? Was it the herpes or something worse? The extinction of Paranthropus was quite an ordeal, 
as it appears to have been the result of a combination of evolutionary specialization, environmental changes, and competition. See, evolutionary biologists categorize organisms into two broad groups. Specialists are organisms that have evolved to thrive in very specific environmental niches, often with highly specialized diets or behaviors. Examples include lice that live exclusively on human hair or body, and the eye eye of Madagascar, which has a uniquely long finger adapted for extracting insects from tree bark. These species excel in stable environments where their specialized adaptations give them a competitive edge. On the other hand, generalists are adaptable creatures that can survive in a wide range of environments and feed on a variety of resources. Think of animals like rats and cockroaches, which are notoriously versatile and resilient. In times of environmental stability, specialists can thrive due to their fine-tuned adaptations. However, during periods of significant environmental change or catastrophe, generalists often have a survival advantage because of their flexibility and adaptability. Now, why bring this up? Well, Paranthropus and early members of the genus Homo exemplify the contrast between specialists and generalists. See, Paranthropus had evolved to become highly specialized in its diet with powerful jaws and large teeth designed for crushing and grinding hard plant materials like seeds and tubers. This dietary specialization made them less adaptable to changes in their environment. In contrast, however, early Homo species such as Homo habilis and Homo erectus were more generalized in their habits. They consumed a broader range of foods like honey, tubers, meat, and more, which made them more adaptable to diverse and changing environments. This flexibility, coupled with their larger brain size and the ability to make and use tools, likely gave early humans a crucial survival advantage over their more specialized relatives. Besides this, the Paranthropus is believed to have preferred wooded riverine landscapes, which provided the specific types of vegetation they were adapted to consume. For example, Paranthropus boise was known to inhabit wetlands along the lakes and rivers in the Great Rift Valley and could tolerate a range of habitats, from woodlands to savannas. However, as environmental conditions shifted, particularly during the arid trends that began around 1.45 million years ago, woodlands retreated, reducing the availability of the resources Paranthropus specialized in. This environmental shift would have forced Paranthropus to compete more directly with other species, including baboons and early humans for the remaining resources. Not to mention the presence of predators like crocodiles, leopards, saber-toothed cats, and hyenas posed significant threats. To make this worse, there is evidence suggesting that Paranthropus individuals, especially males who may have been more solitary, suffered high mortality rates from predation. As the environment became less stable and more competitive, the generalist traits of early Homo likely outcompeted the specialist traits of Paranthropus. The Paranthropus's larger jaws and massive molars, while perfect for their niche diet, became less advantageous when their specific food sources became scarce or when they had to compete for varied resources. As if that wasn't a large enough disadvantage, the smaller brain size in Paranthropus compared to early Homo species might also have been a contributing factor to their inability to adapt to the changing conditions. This, coupled with the high adaptability of early Homo and their success in thriving across diverse environments, Paranthropus struggled to survive in the face of increasing competition and dwindling resources. Sadly, the last known populations of Paranthropus boise in East Africa and Paranthropus robustus in South Africa indicate that they may have persisted until about one million years ago. Today it is believed they eventually succumbed to the pressures of a changing environment and the rise of more adaptable hominins. Known as the dead end lineage, Paranthropus is a truly fascinating branch in human evolution. From their unique diet and distinct appearance to the surprising mark they left on their evolutionary killers, Paranthropus is a stark reminder of just how ruthless the game of evolution can be and how lucky we are to be here today. But what do you think? Were the Paranthropus just dealt a bad hand in the game of survival? Or could their descendants still be out there, hiding in the fossil record? And which prehistoric creature would you like us to explore next? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're here, 
Don't forget to like and subscribe to dive deeper into the wonders of prehistoric times with us. Until next time, stay curious.